Okay, we're in the uh, book of Esther, and we're in chapter 2, and we're going to read from verse 8 down to verse 20, verse 8 down to verse 20, and we'll see this uh, session, we're going to be looking at a royal wedding, and we're going to be looking at a failed assassination attempt. And so if anybody tells you that the Bible is not an interesting book, they've obviously never read it because this is the stuff that uh, TV dramas are made of, royal weddings, uh, assassination attempts that fail, all of these things, all in one chapter, just an amazing section. So verse eight, it says this. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan, the palace, to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house, to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her her things for purification with such things as belonged to her and seven maidens, which were meet to be given her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Now, when every maid's turn was come to go into the king Ahasuerus, after that she had been 12 months according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purifications accomplished to wit six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of the women. Thus, then thus came every maiden unto the king, whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women and unto the king's house. In the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women, to the custody of Shazgaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. She came in unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. Now, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what Haggai the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus, unto his house royal, in the tenth month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast, and he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Esther had not yet showed her kindred, nor her people, as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did the commandment of Mordecai, like as when she was brought up with him. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. So we notice in, in verse 8, and this is kind of uh, some of the things we may have covered a little bit last week, but it, it tells us about uh, the king's commandment, which was, remember, he's come back from a failed military campaign in Greece, uh, he's been defeated, he's been humiliated, and he's now seeking consolation in his harem, and particularly uh, seeking to get a replacement for Vashti. He realized how much he missed Vashti, uh, somebody that he could 
basically uh, share, uh, uh, debrief, I guess, after his military campaigns, get some comfort consolation. So he's now actively, after a four-year hiatus uh, between uh, the deposing of Vashti to now uh, the enthroning of Esther uh, to get some consolation. So it tells us that uh, she uh, came to pass the king's commandment, his decree was heard. And many maidens were gathered together. And again, Josephus tells us actually there were 400 in total that were gathered together to the king's harem. Uh, also, uh, it's interesting that uh, we we also hear from Jewish tradition as well as Josephus that Mordecai was determined to hide Esther. But this was impossible because her beauty was so well known and most likely these king's officers would go into a, a community and they'd ask the question who's the most beautiful girls in this neighborhood and of course everybody had their suggestion and of course esther was one of them so she's taken in to custody of hegai who was uh, responsible for the preparation uh, of the virgins and it tells us, as we're going to see, that she was she found favor in the eyes of Haggai. And it's interesting, isn't it? Just throughout the word of God, we see examples of this. Uh, God's people in difficult places. Uh, we find Joseph uh, finding favor in Egypt wherever he went, whether uh, it was uh, as uh, a steward or whether it was in a prison or it didn't seem to make any difference. Wherever Joseph was, he found favor in Egypt. And then Daniel, we find him as well, finding favor, both in Babylon, and then when there's a change of administration, and the Medes and Persians come, again, Daniel finds favor. And now Esther finds favor in Shushan. Egypt, Babylon, Shushan, major capitals, major government administrations. But God is so great that he can work even in the heart and mind of a keeper of a king's harem and that's what this guy Haggai was he's a keeper of the king's harem uh, 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 and um, Haggai uh, kept these women and he was a uh, cause to favor Esther and again why why was this the case well primarily because God was working behind the scenes as we learned last week that uh, God is behind the scenes but he's moving the scenes that he's behind uh, he's working and even today, God is working in places where you and I might think it was a hopeless situation. We might think he would be absent, but he's at work. And we need more faith in the God of providence that despite how bleak things look and despite how uh, governments seem to be going so uh, far from God and so woke, it doesn't mean that the God of providence is limited in any way, that he's able to work in the most unlikely places and in the most unlikely situations. And so verse 9 says, the maiden pleased him and she obtained kindness of him. He speedily gave her things for purification which, with such things as belonged to her, seven maidens which were meet to be given her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids into the best place of the house of the women. Uh, so again, this this favor uh, came with uh, with great blessings for her. She uh, she got the kind of priority in uh, the material needed for her beauty treatment to prepare her for the king. Uh, she was prescribed a diet, uh, the application of special perfumes and cosmetics, and and a course of court etiquette probably as well. Uh, they were being trained to do one thing. These virgins were being trained for one purpose and that was to satisfy the desires of the king the one who pleased him the most would become his wife and the queen and so that's all the purpose of this this is what this man's mission is is to prepare uh, these women um, for uh, to please the king and so he preferred her and he put her in the, the most conducive place. Uh, he, he put her in, the, if you like, the most airy rooms, the most pleasant rooms in the harem. So again, just uh, we just say the cream always rises to the top. And we, we see this with God's 
favored people that so often uh, he elevates them and gives them uh, special preference and treatment. And so we see in verse 10, Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred uh, for Mordecai I charged her that she should not show it. Uh, and so we, we find that she uh, was very obedient still and uh, certainly held uh, Mordecai, the man who had raised her uh, in great honor. And he had told her to stay silent about her ethnicity. Now, we want to say this, that actually we often think of him as her uncle, but actually he's a cousin. Uh, we'll see that as we get on later, that, that she's actually the cousin, but obviously much older uh, cousin than Esther. But she certainly has great respect uh, for her, uh, for him. And so also, uh, what was his motive in uh, keeping uh, her quiet about her ethnicity. It uh, could be a couple of things. It could be because uh, of trying to protect her uh, from uh, any uh, anti-Semitic feeling, which we're going to see as we move on in this book is never, uh, never far away uh, from the minds of people. Uh, and so that could be part of it. Possibly uh, one commentator says that uh, it, it would remove any legal impediment to her marriage to the king. Uh, perhaps that might be a sticking point if her ethnicity had been known. And so anyway, the bottom line is we know this, the providence of God was at work in these events. And so even his telling her to keep quiet, God's going to use it in a purposeful way. In fact, she will in, indeed disclose her true identity, but she'll do it at the point when the danger to her person was at the greatest when already it had been signed into law, the Jews were going to be killed. And so she, she's going to do it ultimately. But we might just remind ourselves, for, for us as believers today, there's no good reason for hiding the fact that we are Christians. In fact, the sooner we nail our colors to the mast, the better. It's good for us to be out and out, unashamedly identified with the Lord Jesus. And so many Christians, sadly, still act as if they were secret agents. <laughs> and we don't need to do that. We need to be out and public about who we are and whom we serve. And so we certainly don't want to do that. We, we want to make sure that um, we confess him before men. <laughs> and well, it's a good thing to do that. And it's a good thing in a new situation a new job situation, a new course of study, whatever, just to get it out there, day one, who you are, who you serve, who you believe in. I think it's a very important principle. But here, at least, she's obeying her uncle, who's telling her to not reveal her true identity. And so verse 11, it says, Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. And of course, we wonder, well, how did this man have access uh, even uh, to the proximity of the court of the women's house? And who did he know that he could uh, somehow uh, find this information out? And, and the, the writer doesn't give us an explanation. He doesn't feel it's necessary. But the bottom line is that he was in a position somehow to be able to find out about her well-being. And so Mordecai followed Esther's progress day by day. But more importantly, the Lord also was looking out for her and watching her progress day by day. And it's good to know that, isn't it? That the Lord is watching us. He's looking at us and seeing how are we progressing? Are we becoming more beautiful and more attractive for the king every single day? He's looking to see how we're doing. Mordecai, perhaps with a certain anxiety and concern out of his affection for his young cousin, walked daily to pass the court of the house of the women. And he seems uh, to have held the, some kind of post that allowed him certain contact, either with the eunuchs or with the maids who have kept him advised as to Esther's health. And it's just interesting that you, from the English, we wouldn't get this uh, directly when it says, uh, he wanted to know how she did, and that word did actually is a word we're very familiar with. It's the Hebrew word shalom, <laughs> and so 
what he was looking for is this. Uh, he wanted to know about Esther's health, her peace of mind, her prosperity, and her general welfare. In the midst of this trying circumstance, was she at peace? Did she enjoy that shalom in her life? And again, uh, we do have the promise that no matter what our circumstances, that if we're resting in the Lord, we can know that peace, that shalom, which passes all understanding, no matter what our circumstances are. And so he wanted to know, was she at peace? Was it well with her? And it's good to ask one another, isn't it? As we talk to different brothers and sisters, is it well with your soul? Are you knowing that peace uh, and that that peace that passes all understanding in your heart and mind. And so verse 12, it says, Now when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after she had been 12 months according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purifications accomplished, to wit six months with oil of myrrh, six months of sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of the women. Persia was one of the many countries that was famous for its aromatic perfumes and ancient customs for the preparation of brides, including ritualistic baths, plucking of the eyebrows, the painting of hands and feet with henna. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but uh, I've, I've actually met people in, uh, uh, from a Middle Eastern background. And, and one of the things they use is this henna to decorate their hands and their arms and all the rest. Of it. All this would be involved in making the person look beautiful. Facial makeup, application of beautifying paste all over the body, meant to lighten the color of the skin and to remove any spots and blemishes. And one of the reasons for the lengthy period of time, remember, these were all supposed to be virgins. And if there was one who was claiming to be a virgin, who really wasn't, well, by the 12 months uh, was passed, it would be very evident that she wasn't, uh, that she might be with child or whatever. And the king did not want to be charged with fathering a child that was not his. And so that was part of the purpose of the 12 month period. So six months anointing with oil of myrrh, six months with fragrant odors, all for one purpose, to gratify the sensuous pleasure of the king. Now, again, it's important to emphasize this, that all this is, is a record of what happened. There's no sense of divine approval. There's no sense that this is what God wanted, uh, this is just simply telling us the facts. And the Bible often does that. It doesn't say that God necessarily approves of it or disapproves of it. He just tells us this is what happened. In one sense, it, it, it sounds, uh, I guess today, a lot of ladies would like that 12 months of free spa treatments. I mean, that would sound pretty appealing, wouldn't it? Uh, to, to go to the spa for 12 months and have all that pampering and all that uh, all that um, uh, expensive perfumes and oils uh, made available to you. But again, uh, all of this was for one purpose, to make a good impression on the king. And we might ask ourselves, are we constantly preparing ourselves to make ourselves attractive to our king? Now, of course, he, he loved us when we were at our worst, but there is a sense in which we, we should be concerned about seeking to please the king. Are we seeking to please our king and be made beautiful for him? Because remember, we are betrothed to him. <laughs> and we're to be a chaste virgin uh, that's uh, prepared for our heavenly bridegroom. And so what did they use? Well, this myrrh, Kind of an interesting thing, because myrrh, when we think of myrrh, we tend to think of it as part of the embalming process. Remember, at the birth of the Lord Jesus, a very unusual gifts were brought by the wise men from the East, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And it's usually always attract, um, attached to death. And so we might say this. If we want to make ourselves beautiful for the king, we need to apply the oil of myrrh 
to our lives. What does that mean? How we're never going to be attractive to the king unless we die to the old self, right? Unless we experience death, unless we experience that putting to death of the, the flesh and the deeds of the body. And so uh, how willing are we to saturate, saturate ourselves with the oil of myrrh, to die to ourselves, to lose our own lives in order to find our lives in the king rather than in self? And then the sweet odors of spices speak of a pleasant fragrance. And throughout scripture, when you've got this idea of a beautiful aroma, it's usually associated again with sacrifice. Do you remember when Noah came out of the of the ark and he offered uh, these, this burnt offering and it says a beautiful aroma came into the presence of God. And so how can we present a sweet savor to the Lord? And again, it's to do with becoming living sacrifices, dying for self, living for him, becoming more Christ-like in every way so that the beautiful aroma pleases our king. By placing our flesh, our self, our ambitions, our own agenda on the altar. How many of us can truly say that our passion and our priority is to please the Lord? That, that today, what is our goal? What is our ambition? We're living in a culture where it's all about pleasing self. It's all about what I want. And yet, it would be wonderful if every child of God began each day with this desire, Lord, I desire to live in such a way that I bring pleasure to your heart today. <laughs> that would be a great way to start every day. Lord, help me to be one that brings pleasure to your heart. And so certainly, 12 months of this treatment, verse 13, it says, then thus came every maiden to the king. Whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. So there was obviously quite a wardrobe that she could choose from and lots of jewelry and, and various things. And so she could basically kind of come up with ideas of what she thought would attract the king, uh, the latest kind of uh, beauty products or whatever. And so that was made available to her. Uh, and again, it's interesting, isn't it, just to say this, that that the Lord has provided everything for us to be beautiful for him. He's provided all things that pertain to life and godliness. <laughs> and so it's not everything we need to, to please the king is being provided by him at his expense. Everything is being provided so that we can uh, be beautiful for the king. So verse uh, verse 14, it says, in the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned to the second house of the women, to the custody of Shazgaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. She came in unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her. Uh, she was called by name. So here's what happens. After the 12 months of preparation, they take turns to go in to the king. And the maiden chosen to go into the king's presence in the evening would spend the night with him. The next morning, she would return to another part of the harem, not the place of preparation, but then she'd, she'd go to the place of the concubines, the second house, and she'd be placed onto the care of this other uh, eunuch, Shazgaz. And uh, basically, she never returned to the king again unless he was pleased with her and summoned, summoned her by name. And so on the one hand, it sounds wonderful, free spa treatments for a year. And yet there's a catch. And the catch is this, you're there for the pleasure of the king. And if the king is not pleased with you, you're basically set aside and you will live in perpetual widowhood for the rest of your days, never to be called into the king's presence again. Just stuck there with all these other women who are deemed surplus to requirement, but they will never ever be uh, 
uh, allowed to to have a normal life, to marry, to enjoy all those those blessings. It was a very uh, a kind of a sad situation. If you look back uh, to Second Samuel for a second, and chapter twenty and verse three. Because this idea of concubines was not unique uh, to the Persians. Verse 3, it says, And David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in ward, and fed them, but went not in unto them. So they were shut up unto the day of their death, living in widowhood. Those are the ones that had been defiled by Absalom. And basically, they're just shut away uh, in this closed, cloistered world of uh, the other concubines, and they stay there forever until they die. That's the end of them. So, again, a very sad uh, situation in, in every way. Uh, and again, we, we see how the world is, is so different to our king. <laughs> the world is all about use and abuse. <laughs> but our king, he will be ever, forever, the object of his love throughout all eternity. Uh, what a difference. It's, it's just amazing. It's remarkable. So verse 15, so it says, Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, so this is the only time we learn about her father, the uncle of Mordecai. Okay, so... So we see this now that they're actually cousins. He had taken her for his daughter was come to go in unto the king. Notice it says she required nothing but what Hegai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women appointed. And so she she basically she didn't require the extras that the other women needed. She trusted. Hegai, uh, to know what would please the king. Uh, again, just we see something of this submissive spirit of this woman, submitting to her husband, uh, to Mordecai, submitting here uh, to uh, Hegai, and just willing to entrust herself into his hands. And so it, notice it says, as a result of that, it says, and Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked at her. Uh, the idea of this is Esther was lifting up grace. That's the idea of the word favor there in the eyes of all who saw her. Uh, there's a modesty. There's an innocence about the girl which needed no extra artificial allurements. And indeed, it was this unadorned beauty which had so early on appealed to Haggai when first she came into the court which he thought would appeal also to the king. And the New Testament confirms, doesn't it, that there, there is a, a beauty that is not of the world's adornments, a real beauty, uh, not of gold and costly pearls and costly array, but that what we call the hidden man of the heart, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And there is a beauty, isn't there? There's a, there's a, there's a beauty of character. There's an inner beauty. Not that Esther wasn't beautiful in every way. She was chosen because of her beauty, but her beauty was more than just a matter of cosmetics. It was a, a deep inner beauty uh, that was of a meek and quiet spirit. She won the favor of everybody who saw her and when the king saw her, we shall see, he responded her to her with greater enthusiasm than with any other woman that had been in the presence of the king, any of the other virgins. So it says, so Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus, unto his house royal, in the 10th month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And so again, we we notice that there's this elapse from the third year of the reign uh, when the king divorced Vashti to now the seventh year. So again, he Esther is going to become the principal wife four years after Vashti 
was divorced. And, and I just want to say this too, that it's not just that Esther's beautiful and all these things, they, these are all very true. But maybe we should say this too, that Psalm 75, verse six and seven, tells us something that we need to keep in mind. And it says this, for pro promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. It's good to remind ourselves, isn't it? Promotion cometh from the Lord. He puts down one, Vashti, even though an evil man is responsible, but God is still on the throne, right? He's behind, he's giving people choices. They're making their own decisions, but God is still sovereign. And so he puts down one and he sets up another. And so Esther is given this place of favor because, because God is working behind the scenes. And it's good to know that, isn't it? Even in, in our own service, we've got to be faithful. We want to be beautiful for the king. But if he seeks to promote us or demote us, <laughs> either way, he's the one who is the God of providence in control of all things. And so it says, <clears throat> she goes in and verse 17, it tells us, and the king loved Esther above all the women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. In the outworking of his plan, God is able to use the evil of man. God did not make Ahasuerus get drunk or make him demand that his queen present herself in an immodest way before the lords of his kingdom. And yet God allowed this wicked action of man to fulfill the purpose of his greater plan. Good to know, isn't it? It's good for us to be reminded of that. Men have all kinds of schemes. Our world today is filled with schemes and plans and all the rest of it. But it's good to know that God is still on the throne, that he is in control of our circumstances, of our lives. He's entirely dependable and trustworthy. And he's able, if, if, able even, as we often said, to make the wrath of man to praise him. To, to use even man's wrath to fulfill his purposes. So the king loves Esther and uh, places the royal crown on her head, making her queen instead of Vashti. And after seeing Esther, the king had no desire to continue the search. He knew he'd found the one, the replacement. Again, isn't it lovely to think about this? Uh, I think of the parallels between Moses and Esther. Moses and Esther were both born on the trying conditions. If you remember the backgrounds of Mo Moses' birth, all the male children were being killed. He had to be hidden. Why? Because he was a, a beautiful child. Well, it seems like Esther was also a beautiful child. She's in exile. She's lost her parents. Really difficult circumstances. But both Moses and both Esther enter into king's palaces. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? What God can do, taking this lowly orphan and allowing her to be in king's palaces. And so we now see verse 18, the fourth feast in the book. We saw three in chapter one, and now number four. Then the king made a great feast unto all the princes and his servants, even Esther's feast. And he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. So this is the fourth banquet in the book. It seems like the Persian kings used every occasion to celebrate. And so this is uh, like a royal wedding with a big banquet afterwards. And uh, also we, we see uh, that also not just this great feast, it says, uh, Esther's feast, he made a release at, uh, up to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And so it would seem that it was almost a bit like uh, the, the year of Jubilee 
in in Israel's history. Special blessings were were given because of the the royal wedding, and so some taxes were cancelled, servants set free, uh, workers given a vacation from their jobs, and I, I remember that. I remember when. Uh, now the uh, the present king Charles, but I remember when he was Prince Charles and he married Lady Di, and I can remember getting a day off work back then, and um, my wife and I took the opportunity to go hiking and uh, get it because we didn't have a TV anyway, so we weren't going to watch it. So we went up in the, the hiking in uh, some beautiful country, and the roads were empty, and it was we had a phenomenal day out. It was incredible. And again, why why do we get this day off? Well, because there was a royal wedding going on and special privileges were given. And so this, again, be such an amazing event. Esther's feast, a feast given for this lowly orphan girl. Uh, and uh, uh, again, just uh, we too think about it. We have a special wedding feast to look forward to. The marriage supper of the Lamb. What an amazing event that is. And we have no, I mean, we, we can imagine, we, we see the pageantry and the, the glory of, of, of the earthly uh, royal weddings. But what will it be like when we are joined together with our heavenly bridegroom forever and ever? Oh, what a day that will be. What an amazing day it will be. And we'll, uh, we, we, we will just enjoy and again, it's all because of grace. It, Esther found favor. We have found grace and favor. It's it's only because we don't deserve to be at a royal wedding. We deserve to be in the lake of fire. We don't deserve to become the 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 bride of the Lord Jesus. Uh, we deserve eternity in the lake of fire. That's what we deserve. But because of His grace, He has allowed us to go to this amazing banquet <laughs> and to enter into a life of eternal bliss uh, with the heavenly bridegroom. And so what a prospect we have to look forward to. So verse 19, it says, when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. A couple of things here. A lot of questions about this gathering of the virgins a second time. Lots of different ideas. Some suggest that it was simply um, maybe a last parade of the of the uh, the beauty pageant where all the virgins would be paraded together, a second gathering. But but others suggest, and I, I think I prefer this suggestion, that <clears throat> there were still others. Uh, that had to be processed, even though he'd found Esther. Uh, there's still others. Uh, they're not going to become queen. But to think that this man is going to be monogamous for the rest, um, monogam a monogamist for the rest of his life, is ridiculous. Uh, even King David uh, wasn't uh, loyal to his bride. Right? He had wives and concubines. Solomon too. And and to think of a heathen king. Uh, just going to spend the rest of his life with Esther alone. And so he's going to keep filling up the harem until all of them have been processed. Queen or no queen, a man like Ahasuerus wasn't going to be releasing a group of beautiful virgins. He's going to keep on the process. But why are we told this? Well, primarily the main point of verse 19 is this, that as a result of her promotion, it says, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate, probably to do with Esther's influence, may well not have disclosed that he was related, but certainly he is now promoted to the gate. And we've, we've seen in our previous studies that the gate of the city was a place like our law courts today. We saw it in the book of Ruth when business had to be done, it was done in the gate. Uh, we see, uh, even, and that was true not just in Israel, uh, but it was also true in the uh, empires of the East. And we know that from the book of Daniel. If you want to look there, Daniel chapter 2, we'll just notice uh, that Daniel in chapter 2, verse 48 and 49, it says, Then the king made Daniel a great man. 
and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requests, requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. And so, again, it's, it's this promotion again to a place of high authority uh, in the gate, one of the, the judges' position of responsibility. And so that's important for us to understand. Mordecai is put in this place of, of honor. Verse 20, Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people. As Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. So again, we marvel <clears throat> at the providence of God uh, in the, my, the life of a man who was not honoring God, Mordecai. He's, he's put in this place of honor, uh, this place of, of being a uh, uh, sitting in the gate. And of course, it was, it was important. Uh, he was well-placed, uh, not only in terms of his personal status, but also to discern the various winds of power and intrigue that might endanger his cousin Esther. So he's in a good position. He's able to find out what's going on. So in order to uh, keep an eye and protect Esther in that circumstance. But I want to just think about them being secret disciples here in verse 20. She had not shown a kindred because we have another example of that, don't we, in the New Testament. Um, we have two men who we classify as secret disciples in the New Testament. We have Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. And yet both of these men were used of God in a marvelous way to secure the right for the burial of the Lord Jesus and to prepare for the anointing of his body and all of these things. And so in a similar sense, uh, these secret disciples, Mordecai and Esther, are now well-placed to be used of God at a critical hour, just like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were. And again, God is doing that. But again, unless we know for sure that we have, have been prepared for a critical hour, we certainly ought not to be secret disciples. Uh, but in both these instances, God had a specific purpose in using these individuals. Mordecai, um, because Esther had not showed her kindred nor her people, um, so she hadn't showed, notice it, she hadn't showed a kindred either. So, so Mordecai, this is really important for us to understand. Nobody was aware of the connection between Mordecai and Esther. That's why uh, Mordecai was in a place where he could hear of any conspirators and they would be not on their guard. If they knew that he was related to Esther, uh, they would be very careful about making known any assassination plots or things like that, because, uh, well, this guy here, uh, he he's got access, he knows that he knows the queen personally, and so that's part of the reason we're told all this, because of what's coming. How he was able to hear of the assassination attempt, and so they wouldn't be on their guard against him because it wasn't known this connection between Esther and Mordecai not had shown her kindred nor her people so she's now in the position of queen she's still respectful to mordecai the man who reared her she's still not revealing her true identity she's obeying him uh, even at this stage verse 21 it says in those days while mordecai sat in the king's gate two of the king's chamberlains Bigthan and Teresh, of those which kept the door, were wroth and sought to lay hand on the king, Ahasuerus. And so these two officials, obviously, king had done something that enraged them, that got them mad. And uh, politicians are very good 
at, uh, at getting us mad at times by some of the things they do. And uh, again, I think we have to be very careful uh, that we don't listen to too much of that stuff because it can get us very agitated and riled. And these individuals are certainly mad enough to want to execute the king. And so Mordecai overheard this assassination plot against Ahasuerus. And again, it's not, it's not a coincidence. God is going to use this in his providence. Just like Acts 23 in the New Testament, where another assassination attempt comes to the attention of someone who was in a position uh, to, uh, to do something because of his connection with the person who was to be an assassinated. Acts 23 in verse 12 through 16, it says, when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And there were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now, therefore, ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow as though ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning him. And we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. And notice this. this again, God's providence having his people in the right place at the right moment. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. So again, once again, we see God having his people in the right place, overhearing uh, these assassination attempts. And so we certainly see here. So these eunuchs were eunuchs of the door, men who protected the king's private apartments. So very close to access to the king, right? They're, they're doorkeepers of his very, uh, the very presence of uh, his dwelling, the private apartments. They become angry, and uh, the cause of their anger is not stated, although some have suggested that they might have been Vashti loyalists and were not happy about uh, Esther's promotion and Vashti's demotion. Uh, some have suggested that. Uh, how were they going to do this? The Jewish tradition speaks of poison or was their plan to uh, assassinate him. And it is interesting, isn't it? The, the role of the king's cupbearer is very significant, isn't it? Because the king's cupbearer got to taste everything before the king got to, because assassination was a very, very common thing uh, in the intrigue in these Eastern courts and palaces in fact history tells us that this very king king xerxes we call him ahasuerus but we know that remember that's the title like caesar or abimelech or whatever but his real name was xerxes he actually was in fact assassinated in his bedroom in 465 bc in a conspiracy led by one of his chief officials, Artabanus. And this guy, Artabanus, actually had also killed Darius the, the Mede. He was, he was a, a, a political player who was had lust for power and in the process uh, killed Xerxes and also killed Darius the Mede prior to that. And by the way, he was himself killed by Artaxerxes a king that we're familiar with from the New Testament. So he himself, well, he, what he sowed, that he also reaped, and he himself died in that way. And so it's interesting, I was doing some research on, on the death of Xerxes. He was 53 years of age when he died uh, as a result of an assassin, a, a successful assassination attempt. But in this instance, he's preserved. And it tells us in verse 22, it says, the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. 
And so she said, this is who brought it to the attention, Mordecai. And so what was Mordecai doing? Well, he was just obeying the instructions of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29 and verse 7 says this. Speaking to those that would be in exile, it says, and seek the peace of the city whither I have caused you to be carried away captives and pray to the Lord for it, for it, for the peace in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. And so certainly we find that Mordecai was obeying that. He was seeking the welfare of the people where he had been carried away captive. And we notice that no immediate reward is given. It tells us, uh, verse 23, when the Inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree. It was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. And so there's no, there's no immediate reward at all given to Mordecai. And yet God is, again, in his providence, he is going to wait until the perfect moment to reward Mordecai. Going to bring it to the king's attention. He's going to wake him up during the night. He's going to cause the king to want something that would put him back to sleep. And there's nothing more certain would put you to sleep than the reading of, of the, the court uh, dramas and all the rest of it. And so basically, uh, again, of all the, the documents that chosen, it's the one that talks about the assassination attempt and Mordecai. So God saw to it that the facts were permanently recorded in the, the, the official records of the state. And again, God would use, make good use of them in the right time. In one sense, our good works and the things we do for the Lord now, the fruit doesn't always appear immediately. We sow in hope, don't we? We don't necessarily see immediate results. But we, we do know this, that God sees everything. A cup of cold water given in his name will in no wise lose its reward. We, we know that he, he's, he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him, that there will be a reward. And it's a coming day of rewards for the child of God who has faithfully sown without immediate recompense, but has sown and has uh, believed God in faith. Uh, for eternal things and served him in that way, that the day is coming, that there will be that recognition and there will be that reward for loyalty to the king in the day of his rejection, in the day of his hatred. We find a similar situation, don't we, in the story of Joseph. Remember, he befriended a fellow prisoner and was able to tell him his dream. And he said, remember me uh, when you are uh, brought before Pharaoh. And of course, the man completely forgot the kindness that had been shown him for two years. But right at the right moment, he remembers and mentions Joseph. And again, we just see this, this overriding theme in the book of Esther, God's timing God's providence. And is it good to know that God's timing is always perfect? He, he knows the right time to bring something uh, to the fore. So although Mordecai's uh, name and vigilance would be recorded, in the meantime, his action appeared to be forgotten. But eventually, at a most opportune moment, it would be remembered. The plot that Mordecai successfully exposed was nothing compared to the plot he would uncover four years later, planned and perpetrated by Haman, the enemy of the Jews. But we might just uh, close this morning with the lines of a, a great hymn by a marvelous hymn writer and poet, a man who uh, actually struggled tremendously uh, with with mental health issues and trials and uh, had a close friend called John Newton. And it wasn't for John Newton 
Um, this man would have uh, ended his life in despair, but he was a tremendous expressor of truth. William Cowper. And this is the lines of one of the hymns of William Cowper. And it's really fitting in the light of the book of Esther. It says this, God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. I hope we're glad this morning that God still moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform, that we still worship the God of providence. But let's trust the Lord to strengthen our faith and confidence in the God who is at work, even if we can't see it right now with our physical eyes, to believe that he's working working in our world, working in our lives, working in our assemblies. Uh, he's never inactive. He never slumbers or sleeps. He's always working to accomplish his purposes. The day of Mordecai's reward might be delayed for a while, but it will come. And our reward for service rendered to the Lord will come. The day is coming. The crowning day is coming. We look forward to that day. But in the meantime, in faith, we pursue serving the best of masters. Amen.